Uh, well, hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> I'd just like to start by thanking uh, everybody I've had the pleasure to be involved with over the course of uh, this project, um, most of whom, but not all, are represented in that picture there. Um, and I have also had the good luck of having um, a good bit of funding throughout this project, and uh, that's all thanks to Kai. So thanks to everybody there. And thanks to you all for uh, showing up and listening to uh, a little bit about uh, what I've gone through for the last few years. So um, I'm not really going to belabor the fact that um, we use models for understanding the world around us. The idea of mental models is understood um, by other people in our department way better than me, and I don't really have the time to go into it anyway. So I'm just going to focus on the idea of ecosystem models, these, uh, these tools that we use to try and understand complex ecological systems with multiple species, um, multiple processes across, that vary across space and time, these sorts of things. And uh, I'd like to say that I came to this department um, with a background in habitat suitability modeling, which is a type of ecosystem model. It's not unlike the one you see here. Um, and I, I, I came here because there's, uh, there, there seems to be a bit of disconnect in how these models are, are approached or, or what we expect from them. Um, we've been doing this sort of ecosystem modeling for over 30 years since uh, PCs first hit the desktops in the, in the early 80s. This is not a new idea, this building of ecosystem models. And yet, in 30 years, these models have yet to penetrate significantly into decision and policy making. So I came here wondering why that might be. I probably could have just asked Hadi, but uh, we all have to follow our own path. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so over 30 years, we still haven't made any penetration. And this is despite now, uh, we, have, we have recent calls for increasing model complexity through the coupling of ecosystem models with models of social systems. Uh, and we have ridiculous calls for increasing scope, like this one here. And there's absolutely no evidence that increasing scope will increase the ability of models or the, the, the penetration of models into decision making. In fact, quite the opposite. And what I'm going to argue is that, um, well, um, what, what, what seems to be the case is that there's this increasingly distorted or misguided view of what models can actually do. And what I'm going to argue is that that's in large part due to how uncertainty is treated and how, and how the assumptions that underlie these models are, 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 are treated or, or not. So this is really about the uncertainty and more of what we don't know. Um, and uncertainty is, uh, is often implicit and it, it, it underlies the assumptions that we use in models. Models are based on assumptions. You assume away stuff you, that you don't think is relevant creating externalities, but you never go back to those. They're left implicit for the most part. And if the assumptions are implicit, then of course the uncertainties are hidden as well. The other thing is that this is not a lot of fun. You don't get really interesting results from this. You're basically telling people that they don't know as much as they think they know, and that's not all that sexy or exciting. Um, but this, this, this implicitness of assumptions and the uncertainty with them leads to overconfidence in model results. This is, this is some of the formative, this, is, this, this underlies a lot of the work by Kahneman and, and, and Tversky about how basically what you see is what you know. And we don't think a lot about the stuff that isn't presented to us. Okay, so I'm just gonna walk you through the, 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 the sort of the context setting chapter. Uh, that demonstrates that this is actually a problem. I looked at a bunch of literature uh, over a 10-year period, and uh, everything that, that, said that, uh, that claimed it was an ecosystem-based model, I looked through the literature, and I selected the most popular based on the citation rate, so the number of citations uh, per year that these papers uh, achieved. I took a sample of 60, and I reviewed all the papers for their stated policy relevance, what they thought that they were doing in, for ecosystem-based management, how they treated uncertainties, and how they treated, how they expressed their design assumptions. Okay, so 
just straight to the results here. Um, I looked at uncertainty and I looked, used categorical variables, whether they made no mention of uncertainty, whether there was just a sort of, uh, just a mention of uncertainty, sort of a validating or a, um, there we are, just a mention of uncertainty, whether they actually tried to interpret some of the uncertainty of the model or treated it in some way, whether through some Monte Carlo simulation or some multi-model averaging or comparisons. And not surprisingly, because I'm sitting here talking to you about it, over half of them pretty much ignored the, uh, ignored the uncertainty. The, the mentions, the word that I was looking for was valorizing. Uncertainty is often mentioned in one sentence in these papers saying uncertainty should be considered or, you know, we need to look at the uncertainty. Um, very few of them used it for interpretation and a few more actually treated it. So this is, this is really a big problem. On the assumption side, uh, the graph's a little bit more complicated because I have four classes of assumptions here. Assumptions about your model extents, what you're going to put into it, the spatial extents, the temporal extents. Um, assumptions about the resolution, whether you're going to use a time average model, whether you're going to include or exclude space, uh, what sort of species or, or, or social groups you're going to include. That's all a resolution kind of question. You make assumptions about processes, and you make assumptions about how the data fit in. So these are four classes of assumptions that I identified that, that uh, needed to be made in the modeling context. And in terms of how they scored, um, this is sort of from a bottom up. They either made no mention of assumptions, they're mentioned in the methods, assumptions were mentioned and used in the interpretation, or both interpretation and methods. And again, you can see that over half of the models um, left these assumptions pretty much implicit. Process assumptions were most often mentioned in the methods, um, and that's kind of understandable if we're looking at ecosystems, people think about the dynamics. But for the most part, uh, assumptions and uncertainty were treated very poorly in the popular literature, in the most popular literature that I looked at. In terms of what these models were trying to do in an ecosystem-based context. They all claim to be relevant for ecosystem-based management. That was one of the search criteria. But less than 10% gave a relevant management application that they were trying to uh, support. So again, a lot of valorizing here in the, uh, in the papers saying we're good, we're going to do this, but then we really don't. So not addressing assumptions on uncertainties has a lot of implications. I mean, it compromises the uptake of results, obviously, because managers uh, and policymakers know that there's uncertainties in, in these models, but they're not explicit. So it makes it harder to, um, harder to convince people that your model's uh, contributing something. It can lead to misunderstanding and bad decisions if the models are actually used, because you don't know what to use it for exactly or what not to use it for. And this recent trend towards coupling uh, social and ecological models is also quite handicapped by this because if you pick up a few models that you want to use as components and you want to stick them together, it can be really useful to know how, um, how much you can rely on each of the model components for each of the indicators that it's actually rep it claims to be representing. Now, I want to emphasize that uh, th this isn't the state of modeling in general. These were the most popular papers. There's a lot of good work being done on uncertainty, but the papers aren't being read. Uh, the interesting thing that Fawcett and Higgins showed, Higginson showed was that the, 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 the citation rate of papers goes down with the increase as, as the number of equations in it increases. And the threshold is about three. Beyond three equations, the papers just aren't getting read. So there's a lot of good technical work being done, but it's not accessible. Hmm. Or it's not being accessed. A <laughs> good strategy. Yeah, so I was, this, this review was really about the popular papers, not the good papers on uncertainty. That's, that's an important point. Okay, so, I mean, clarity is part of the solution, right? Obviously, um, every, every modeling textbook, every modeling how-to book says a clear research question. Have good objectives, a clear question. Um, you're also encouraged to describe your uncertainties and, uh, and articulate your design decisions. 
Um, these again about the model scope, the processes, and the data. These are all categories of decisions. And this is before you even start modeling. This is just as you, as, as you start putting the framework or the design of your model together. So we can improve the clarity, but I'd ask if this pursuit of understanding, remember I started with ecosystem models for understanding ecosystems, is the pursuit of understanding sufficient? And I submit that it's not. And the reason it's not is because of something uh, that we're calling a spiral of complexity. Imagine for a minute that you're trying to model the catchable biomass of some species. And this is the, this is the true value to maintain some sort of sustainable uh, population um, with some confidence interval around it. Now, what we assume is that adding information, and it's usually true, adding information to a model improves the precision and the accuracy. And we add information by, with improved data or improving the resolution or adding improved processes to our model. So we assume that as we do this, we're going to get closer to that true distribution. But this approach takes time, so it takes money. Um, and it can lead to sort of unresponsive, overly complex models because as you're trying to understand stuff, it may not respond to the harvesting pressure or the climate changes or the habitat changes that, uh, that you think it might. And it has no clear decision relevance because you're working towards understanding the ecosystem. You don't have a clear uh, management objective for it. And consequently, there is no clear endpoint to this exercise of modeling for understanding. We polish our models, we polish our models, we hope that we get close to the real value, and that's really our goal. What I'm working towards is the idea of developing a clear endpoint for modeling to support decision making. And I'm working on that through this idea of sufficiency. When is a model sufficient for a decision context? This is, this is quite an old idea. Um, the idea is, is quite simple. Uh, a model for a decision context is sufficient when adding more information to the model doesn't change the decision that you're going to make. I wish it was that simple. Um, but it requires a decision context, obviously, which comes with alternatives that you choose between, um, objectives that you're trying to achieve that you measure the alternatives with, and some risk tolerance describing how, how precise you need the answers to be. I'm working on this, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about this in, in, uh, in, in, not in two ways, but with two components to it. A contextual sufficiency, is the model that I have sufficient for the context that I'm trying to apply it to? Um, another way of thinking about that is are all the assumptions in the model um, relevant and credible for the decision that, uh, that I'm trying to make or the question that I'm asking. And the idea of technical sufficiency, which is this idea of model accuracy, model precision, really the predicted difference between uh, these two alternatives that you're trying to choose between in a decision context. And what the technical sufficiency might look like in this little cartoon of a graph is um, with complexity, as you increase your model complexity along this axis here, the values for your three alternatives here are gonna bounce around a little bit. You can see the pink one starts up here, yellow one starts down here. As you add model complexity, you might expect that the difference between these, or at least the relative rank of them, stabilizes. So at this point, you might conclude that adding more information doesn't change the relative rank of those alternatives. So that would be technically sufficient. So um, I'm just going to lay out the, the, the steps and the approach that I'm taking. Then I'll go back to that technical uncertainty for a minute. Um, my second chapter, we'll look at the, param the parametric and structural uncertainty and how that influences indicators. I'll show you a little bit more of that in a second. Um, and once I have these estimates of ecosystem service supply, I'm going to spatialize them for our study area because a lot of ecosystem services, particularly the social and cultural ones, are place-based, and so they need a spatial context. And finally, I'm gonna pull these two pieces together um, and hopefully demonstrate that uh, sufficiency can be demonstrated uh, if you have a good decision context. So, but for the rest of today, I'll just talk about uh, some preliminary results from the second chapter. 
To talk about that, I'll just introduce uh, the case study where we're working, uh, which is the west coast of Vancouver Island here. For those of you new to the department, you're over here in Vancouver. Vancouver Island's a big piece of land across the water. Um, and we're, we're thinking about the sea otter trophic cascade. Many of you have probably heard about this. Uh, it's um, simply an ecological um, effect or a, a phenomenon in the, in, the, in the near shore environment where sea otters uh, eat urchins and urchins eat kelp. What happened uh, several hundred years ago is that sea otters were extirpated, allowing urchins to escape predation uh, pressure and so reduce kelp, uh, leading to a lot of kelp barrens in the near shore. Sea otters were reintroduced in the 70s, driving down urchin populations and allowing the kelp to recover. So there's this switch between two systems mediated by sea otters in the system. You can, uh, in the sea otters, in the absence of sea otters, humans being what we are, we uh, decided that urchins were good to eat, uh, along with a bunch of other invertebrates that, uh, that sea otters consume. And so we developed a lot of lucrative fisheries around sea urchins and other invertebrates, um, which are now threatened with the recovery of sea otters because there's competition for the same prey. So the management problem is how to, how to manage a listed species, because sea otters are still a listed species under SARA, that consumes valuable fisheries resources. Okay, so that's the management problem. The decision context looks kind of like this. It's not complete, but this is, this is what I'm addressing with my thesis. So there's a management lever up here, uh, controlling otters in some way. There's also a governance one. Um, we've got a bunch of ecosystem state kind of indicators here um, that translate to some ecosystem service kind of things that are then rolled up in your classic sort of triple bottom line, uh, profits, uh, people, planet kind of thing that lead to some sort of well-being. So I'm not addressing a lot, any of the values associated with this. This is an illustrative example of how the ecosystem effects might roll up into well-being. Okay. Now, while I am looking at this whole thing for today's sort of example, I'm going to focus on the difference between economic benefit and ecosystem health. And uh, I'll just look at two alternatives from the otter side. Okay, that's great. Two alternatives from the uh, otter side, simply no otters um, or otters at carrying capacity. Okay, um, so those are the two states. Uh, two examples of changing the data in the model are just some life history parameters on urchins, one of the invertebrates, and you can find these parameters pretty much anywhere. You can find generic parameters in the literature, and I'm comparing those to some parameters that were obtained through a targeted study within our study area. Okay. I'm also going to show you the resu results of a structural change by increasing the trophic resolution of the model. I did this in, uh, in that EcoPath tool that they work on the third floor, work on on the third floor. Um, and so the structural change that I, th that I applied was changing a functional group and pulling out some individual species. Functional groups are collections of animals that function roughly the same way in a trophic, uh, in a trophic system. So you might have invertebrates or forage fish as a functional group that collect uh, the relevant species in them. So. I'm going to show you the results of a, a change in the data then and a change in the structure, in the trophic structure. Okay. And this is what's that, what that's going to look like. This is an increasing value on the X. It's illustrative, so I removed the values. Um, these are the two states, otters at carrying capacity and no otters. And this is just the total living biomass in the modeled system. Okay. So starting with a simple reference sort of model, improving the data, set, creates some separation between the two distributions, and improving this, the, uh, the model structure increases that separation. The distributions here I got by um, varying the parameters of the EcoPath model, so doing sort of a Monte Carlo simulation, so you can um, imagine those as sort of a probability distribution around the actual values. Okay, the two, now living biomass translates quite easily into dollar value. Um, so that's not much of a surprise there. The interesting part of the comparison is if you look at metrics of ecosystem health. Uh, so these are bouncing around too. Um, and at least in this, this sort of, th this preliminary example, 
you kind of see that there seems to be or might be a bit of a trade-off between uh, dollar value and this measure of ecosystem health. Ultimately, I'm just working through the design of the complexity here now, these different stages. Ultimately, again, I hope to sort of look at uh, three different alternatives and get some stabilization over about this range of complexity, about 10 or 15 models. So that's where this is going. Um, to spatialize it, this is the fun part for me. The rest of this is really, um, to spatialize it, I've put together a lot of spatial data for the west coast of the island. This is a 20 meter bathymetry, um, which again, we need to sort of place communities and resources on. That'll be the next step. Um, I ran it up land. In, if, in case any of you are interested in this sort of stuff, we can talk later. This is a 20 meter resolution that goes from about 50 meters to five kilometers inland. Uh, that allows me to cross the intertidal, which is important from a lot of habitat modeling perspectives. It gives shade, it gives protection from wind and stuff, which is important for different species. So one of the few bathymetries that actually crosses the intertidal. And um, in terms of pulling all this together, I, I'm looking at ways to combine this, con this, the technical and the contextual uncertainty, which I haven't said much about. Um, the technical uncertainty can be quantified, as I think I've showed you, with probability distributions. Contextual uncertainty reflects our belief in the system. So this is, this is, this is kind of um, interesting because it's how much you believe your assumptions, how much you believe in the model. And I'm looking at two different ways to, to pull those two pieces together. One is a Bayesian belief network, which is good if you think about belief, um, and a weights of evidence approach. But this is still sort of still trying to work through this. So. What I can tell you so far is that I really believe we need to be more explicit and perhaps standardized in, uh, in, in our, about our model assumptions and our uncertainties. Um, yeah, we need decision context in our models. These, this, uh, these models that we spin up to try and understand ecosystems are great, but they don't, uh, there's no evidence that they help decision makers. And uh, explicitly framing the decision context can improve model relevance and also let us know when we're finished modeling. Thank you. So um, any ecosystem, the question is whether uh, tools for evaluating model performance um, have some bearing on model sufficiency. And I think that, I mean, they do in an understanding context, right? Uh, Akaki's information criteria or, uh, or other measures of performance uh, are about how well your model fits a particular data set. Um, and that's an understanding idea, right? That's, uh, th that gives you a measure of how well your model represents the system. I don't think that it contributes much to the decision-making part of things. You still don't know whether your model is good enough for a particular decision because there will always be another data set that you can collect that your model won't predict that well. Yeah, Robin. I think these conclusions can generalize to all types of models. I certainly looked at both statistical and mechanistic models. I mean, these days the modeling has come far enough that people understand that they need to evaluate or validate their models in some way, right? And you do, and, and statistical models are a perfect example of that. But I, I don't think that knowing how well your model fits a particular data set 
that, that, that doesn't um, automatically makes it, make it relevant to the decision context. I mean, the fisheries models are good examples of that. You know, they model fish populations and the models uh, do a good job, perhaps, of predicting fish dynamics over time. But they don't, the, the only thing that can, they can inform is harvest rate. They can't inform changes from habitat, uh, changes to habitat or changes to, 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 to environment or even changes in species distribution. And those are the best models, best ecosystem models, I think, that we have from a decision perspective are the fisheries ones. So any other model will be less, uh, less suited to decision making than those. Adi. Well, um, much of it is new to me because I didn't take your course. Um, but um, I'm not sure I, if yeah, perhaps none of it is new. Um, I think the idea of handling sufficiency as a different, uh, 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 dividing it into technical uncertainty and, and the idea of belief, uh, so I haven't. In decision making, you have to be sure. If you don't, you get your point. Otherwise, you lose for when you stop gathering data, all of those things. You're going to find you have a phase state and you have to choose which side of it to fall on. Giant collateral under the Greg. discussion, I want to open up the door. And I don't think it's a seminar. I think it's a process in our unit. Yeah. But just sort of one comment, I guess, on that, Hadi, is it's hard to know where you're going when you start. You know, I, I did have a look at your work, and at the, in the beginning, it seemed rather more technical than the stuff that I was used to because I'm coming from a habitat modeling perspective. Yeah, so the and equation problem is being hinted at. Pardon me? Simple. Just no, 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 no. <laughs> I'd love to talk to you about it now. Yeah.
Is it dry? Just in case I have to spray. Oh, great. It'll love that. <laughs> no, no, I adjusted it. I adjusted it. Okay. Did you take it off already? Take what off? System. Oh, oh okay, so now it now recognizes it. It did recognize it. Oh. There we go. So pulling it out, eh? Oh, not this. That's it. That's perfect. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so. My talk today is what's the matter with organic matter? And I have to admit that this is kind of a good segue actually, because when initially I knew I was gonna do this presentation, I was really nervous about it. And <laughs> I was really nervous about it just because I come from a chemistry background. And it's a stereotype, but in some cases it's true, and I would put myself there, is that scientists can be really boring. And I was nervous a little bit about trying to appeal to the broad worldviews that are within, represented by the department and that would be hopefully here today. So I, I thought I'd start really broadly with probably the most famous view of the world that is out there. And this is the picture of the earth, really famous pictures of the earth that was taken by the Apollo 17. And what's interesting about it is historically people use this as kind of a, a defining an, a new age of environmental thought, that people looked at this and they saw something that was delicate and something that would needed care. So the image of Earth was everywhere. It seemed to some to mark a new phase of civilization, the beginning of the age of ecology. Now, what I wanted to introduce was, I come from a chemistry background. So what does a, this look like from a biogeochemical perspective? So I would argue that it's not nearly as, as aesthetic, but it, doesn't lack for the beauty of the initial, of the picture we just saw, is that looking at the world as a series of interconnected biogeochemical processes, one of which is this global carbon cycle. And everybody in this room is familiar with it because of uh, concerns over climate change. And so what is interesting from my perspective as a biogeochemist is this interaction within these cycles one of which is carbon, is that, that humans are not only having an effect on them, but we're also being affected by them. So there's this interaction between the effect we're having on these biogeochemical cycles and the corresponding effect that they're having on us. So for my talk, I wanted to focus, or I'm going to focus today on this small segment of the carbon cycle, this, this part right here, this stuff that the carbon that's being exported and transported within surface waters. And it's something that I didn't know much about until I started my work here. Then hopefully by the end of today's talk, people share my worldview a little bit in terms of looking at the world from this biogeochemical perspective. So the overview of my talk, I'm gonna first introduce organic matter in surface waters, what it is and why I think it's important. And I'm gonna spend, spend the majority of my talk here. So this idea of how do we affect this biogeochemical cycle that's affecting organic material and surface waters. I'll, I'm looking specifically at the effect of forest harvest on organic matter export. I'll introduce some of the, our study aims and the methods that we've used, as well as some of the results that we've seen to date, noting this is still a process or a project that's very much in progress. One of which is the trends of organic matter as dissolved organic matter over time. So the export of orga organic material in surface waters from areas that are affected by forest harvest. The second thing I'm going to talk about in this part is the trends in the quality of organic matter. I'll also talk about what that actually means. And I'm going to end my talk by very, very briefly introducing some of the work that I'm doing that deals with how are we affected by these bio biogeochemical cycles and how I see us as being affected by these 
big biogeochemical cycles that deal with organic material in water is through our use of, of drinking water. So first of all, um, I'm going to start with what is organic matter. And for the purpose of my talk, when I say organic matter, what I'm referring to is organic material that's present within uh, surface waters. And so chemically speaking, this refers to a really heterogeneous, huge group of chemical compounds that's present in both dissolved and particulate forms in surface waters. Now how these, how um, this organic material got into the surface waters arises from a combination of ecological processes, hydrologic and climatic conditions that are happening, um, happening within these different ecosystems that I'll be talking about today. So in terms of fluxes of organic material into waters, typically what we think about and what, how the literature partitions it is into three general um, fluxes. So the first is inputs that ha occur because of anthropogenic inputs. This is directly inputs that are um, caused by human activities such as discharge of wastewater. The second is this terrestrial input. And this is occurring predominantly through export of organic material that's within soils that gets exported into surface waters. Thirdly, organic material can arise in surface waters because of the input that's actually happening within the stream. This is as a result predominantly of microbial processes that are happening actually within aquatic environments. Okay, so in terms of thinking about how we actually affect this, these biogeochemical cycles, obviously we have a huge effect on the biogeochemical cycling of carbon within surface waters through our anthropogenic inputs. And like I said, this stems primarily from discharge of wastewater that can be enriched with various forms of organic material as well as land use such as agriculture. And in terms of this terrestrial inputs, we can affect this through land use changes such as forest harvest activities, which is where I'll be spending the majority of my talk today. So why bother studying organic matter? Um, I've, I've kind of partitioned this into two kind of main motivations. And the, so the first deals with eco -hydro, er, ecological and hydrological motivations, what it actually does within the environment. So first of all, organic matter within waters, um, it's a fuel for microbes. Um, it is also redox active, so those are, that means that it participates in chemical reactions. So other biogeochemical processes that are happening within these environments, such as, um, such as denitrification and nitrification cycles. Thirdly, and this is kind of funny that I put it here because this is where a lot of research, why, or why a lot of research really began in organic matter in surface waters is this idea that organic matter acts as a kind of aquatic sunscreen. So it regulates how much UV light is actually penetrating into aquatic environments, which is obviously important as that's one of the main energy influxes into these environments. Lastly, it can chelate and transport metals, which is important in terms of the fact that it can cause pollution over a wider, or a wider area. Now the, the second kind of motivation for why I think organic matter is cool and interesting, deals with the human impacts. So again, how are we impacted by these biogeochemical cycles? The first, and what's happened, or what a lot of literature focuses on, is that uh, organic matter in water that we use for drinking water, and that we, that we disinfect, can form these potentially carcinogenic disinfection byproducts. So a lot of research has gone into how these form, how these can be removed from, uh, from waters, as well as uh, studies about um, the health effects over long-term exposures to these types of compounds. Um, secondly, in terms of trying to treat water for drinking water, these um, organic, or organic matter in water can be difficult and expensive to actually remove. Um, it's responsible for certain aesthetic properties such as color, which relates to the fact that it acts as this aquatic sunscreen. And it can also cause microbial regrowth which is important in terms of the fact that um, in terms of uh, you have to maintain your system more as well as you can get um, pathogen regrowth if, if it, this issue is, is prevalent. So like, like I, I mentioned, one of the land use um, 
changes that can actually affect the way that organic matter originates in soil is through forest harvest. This is important for BC because the majority, so 60% of British Columbia's land base, is actually classified as forest, and a small percentage of this is within protected areas. Forest harvest, and as an industry, is still an economic player in British Columbia, not to the degree that it was historically, but as of 2009, it provided 4% of the total provincial economic activity, 3% of total exports, and 7% of jobs. So it's still important in terms of BC's economy. However, previous studies that look at the effect of logging on ecological and hydrologic processes show that it can have a large and deleterious effect, including fragmentation of forest habitat, disruption of forest morphology, as well as um, processes that can affect surface water quality, including increased sedimentation and nutrient transport, uh, destruction of riparian habitat, and increased peak storm flow, so increased discharge upon precipitation. So the first part that I wanted to talk about um, was, um, is this, or the question that we, we pose is, how does forest harvest actually affect organic material and organic matter export within systems that are affected by it? And this includes both the concentration, so the flux of organic material out of these systems, as well as the quality, so the chemical composition. Is there a change in the chemical species that are actually exported out of these ecosystems upon harvest? So, our study site that we're looking at is just south of Campbell River, also located on Vancouver Island. Um, it's a 91 hectare, second growth, Douglas fir dominated forest. And it's, what's interesting about it is the headwaters of a stream. So it's where a stream originates in this area. It was originally planted in 1949, and it was harvested via clear cutting in late 2010. So here's this uh, watershed delineation where we're looking at. Here's our water quality site. And then here is the area that's been affected by clear cutting. What's also interesting about this site is that um, it's the site of a Fluxnet Canada site, which is measuring the greenhouse gas emissions since the early 1990s. So it's an interesting augmentation of this um, in terms of looking at carbon balance. So how is forest harvest affecting carbon balance? We have some information about the greenhouse gas emissions. Now we're looking at the carbon that's actually present within the aquatic environment. So this is the, our study site, and you can see that, um, I wanted to show this picture because you can see, first of all, that the extent of logging is quite noticeable on the landscape, but also that, and this is important in terms of DOC and organic, or organic matter export, is that the, there wasn't a lot of riparian treatment. So riparian is the zone that's immediately adjacent to uh, a water body, and there wasn't a, a great deal of buffer. Most, the majority of these trees actually that are part of the riparian buffer, riparian buffer are now gone. They've fallen over. So how are we actually measuring organic matter? We're using this uh, in situ UV vis spectrophotometer. So this instrument has sat in the stream since late 2009. And what it's done is every 30 minutes it takes uh, it or takes a, a measurement of the absorbance spectrum of stream water that's flowing by. Now from this absorbance spectrum, what we can calculate are proxies for certain water quality parameters, including turbidity and nitrate, but also for the purpose of this talk, what we can calculate is proxies for the concentration of dissolved organic carbon, so organic matter that's actually dissolved within the water. What we can also do is we can calculate proxies for Quality. So what is actually, what are the chemicals that are actually within that organic matter fraction? So if we can see what this has allowed us to do over the past four years is have this trace. So we can see here's our DOC concentration measured approximately every 30 minutes. Um, and now we can co start correlating this with hydrologic parameters such as discharge in blue that's also been measured at the site. So now the first question that we really wanted to look at is, does forest harvest increase the carbon export as dissolved organic carbon? So the amount of carbon that's actually being exported from this site. So now what we're trying to do is look at the response of um, DOC, so organic matter that's again dissolved within the stream itself, before 
and after harvest. And now, what this is showing is this is the response of DOC to increase discharge. So discharge is the amount of stream water that's actually flowing past. Obviously, when you get something like a precipitation event, you get an increase in discharge. But what's interesting about this is that the period that's immediately following logging, the amount of DOC, or the concentration of DOC responds in a larger manner than that compared to the pre-logging period. So we can see even for something where the discharge is the same, the, amount, or the DOC concentration is relatively higher, even though the pattern of this response is similar between the two, the two periods. But that still doesn't answer our question. So is more carbon being exported in the post-logging period? So this is a monthly mean of the hour D, hourly DOC export in milligrams per meter squared of the watershed area itself. And what we can see from this trace over time is that there's a strong seasonality to this export. So we can see in this rainy winter months that this export, we can, we can see that it's quite prominent when the majority of export is actually happening. And that's within the rainy winter months, which makes sense. We have more water that's falling on the soil, more um, soil carbon that's actually being exported. Now, if we compare the pre-harvest to the post-harvest period in terms of the hourly mean carbon that's being exported, we can see a small but significant increase in the DOC carbon that's exported during the winter months, noting that we are missing some of the winter months for the pre-period. So this is this, this um, the winter months would be here and here for the post there wasn't a significant increase in the amount of carbon or as DOC exported during the dry summer months. So the second aim of this was what actually happens to the DOC quality upon forest harvest. So that's the chemical composition of the organic material that's being exported by the stream. And so previous studies have shown that if you do have an increase in DOC export, what could be driving this is an increase in groundwater height. And what that does is it actually begins to leach some of the, or, the organic material that's stored within the soil. So the idea here is that the DOC, so the organic material that's stored in the soil, could be different in terms of the chemical composition um, than that which goes through hydrologic flow paths that were present before harvest. So is this the case for our watershed? Is it, are we seeing this increase in DOC export because our our base flow is coming, is, is higher, and it's starting to take away the, the carbon that's being stored there. So one of the, the quality parameters that is looked at extensively in the literature is this SUVA. And SUVA correlates to the concentration of aromatic or large carbon that's within the organic matter uh, fraction. And this, so far, like I said, this is, we're still working on this, but um, so far what was seen is a slight decrease in the aromaticity of DOC upon harvest, which is somewhat surprising. So not completely sure what to make of this yet. Um, but what's also interesting, if we look at some of the other um, proxies for the chemical species that are within the organic material, um, if we look at the CDOM parameter, which is a proxy for the concentration of colored organic material, we can see that the post-harvest CDOM is quite a bit larger than that, is significantly larger than that of the pre-harvest. What's interesting about looking at this CDOM and this increase in the concentration of colored dissolved organic matter is that this is what is largely responsible for a lot of the optical properties of natural waters, um, such as that aquatic sunscreen idea that I was talking about, as well as it's quite bioavailable, so it plays roles in biogeochemical and photochemical processes. Okay, so I have three minutes, and I wanted to touch briefly on the second part of what I'm currently doing, so my most current work. And so from this, the preliminary conclusions from that first part I was talking about, how we affect the biogeochemical cycling by going and harvesting a site, we can see that forest harvest can increase DOC concentration of flux, and it can also affect the composition of this, of this organic material that's being exported. So it can change the chemical qualities of the organic material that's being exported from the watershed. So the second thought with this, and I'm, not, I'm really gonna be very brief with this because this is 
very much a work in progress, is that whether this increased concentration of, is this idea that increasing concentrations of especially reactive organic material is correlated with the formation of these potentially carcinogenic disinfection byproducts and this idea of biofilm growth. So this is where if we have different types and more organic material in water, it can directly affect the way that we can actually use it. But the question here is, don't we protect our drinking watersheds? So would logging really be an issue in terms of, would this, this kind of effects that I've showed in part one, would that really be an effect for the watersheds that we actually use for drinking? And the answer to that is we don't really protect our drinking watersheds. So the study site that, that I've presented and that I've discussed is actually part of the Oyster River watershed, which is a secondary drinking water source for Campbell River and the surrounding rural areas. So I think in the late 18 or 1980s, something like 40% of the discharge of the Oyster River was actually allocated to water license for drinking water. And secondly, just to highlight this, um, this is uh, a satellite image taken from MC Hansen et al. And what they did is they looked at the change in forest, uh, forest cover from 2000 to 2010, where the red is a loss of forest cover. And this is Comox Lake, which is the drinking water source for Courtney and surrounding areas. So obviously, drinking water protection is something that a lot of municipalities outside of Vancouver and Victoria struggle with in British Columbia. So my, the work that I'm kind of doing right now, and I wanted to present it because I'm excited about it. Hopefully, <laughs> don't get too messed up it. But anyway, so the idea of the, the, what I'm doing and focusing on now is to try to quantify some of the concentrations and qualities of organic material that's within these watersheds using some of the methods that I've, that I've shown. And the second aim of this is to actually start correlating some of these concentration and quality conditions with the concentration of disinfection byproducts, something that can directly harm human health um, upon chlorination. Okay, so for acknowledgements, I'd like to thank first the UBC Ecohydrology Group, especially um, Mark and Ian, they were really present for the advent of this project. Um, I'd like to also thank Angela, she provided a lot of feedback and help. Um, the UBC Biometeorology Group, they're the ones that have the FluxNet site um, and provide a lot of uh, climatic data as well as other help and then funding sources for this project. Merci. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so you're absolutely right. So the, the, the range of this, this CDOM is greater in this, in, or it appears to be greater in the, in the summer months than it does in the rainier winter months. And what I would attribute that to is, remember there's three pathways of organic matter that go into surface waters, one of which is the microbial processing of organic material. So it could be that, um, Either this is coming from microbial processing of organic matter that's within that, noting that we don't have a dilution effect because we're not seeing a lot of rainfall and a lot of discharge. Um, and the other thing could be there's, because of the fact that we see there's less rain, um, more water within the stream comes from base flow as, as opposed to coming, so it comes from different soil horizons as opposed to coming from, from higher in the, in the soil when there's a lot of rain. So it could be one of those. Um, so one thing that, like I mentioned, that um, this could be affected by harvest if the base flow is increased. So if you remove the trees, then, um, and this is very, I, I'm, I'm just kind of, this is kind of subjective. So I, I'm not totally sure is my, is my short answer. But you've removed the, the the cover. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So you've, you've, you've changed the, the pathways that water is actually entering the, the uh, stream itself. So it, it could be that as that increases, then as you've increased the big, you've removed the trees, less evapotranspiration, the water table rises. 
so what could be happening is you could be importing more organic material within the summer months from higher in the soil horizons, or higher in the soil horizon than previously. Because it's exactly that. The trees were taking up water, decreasing base flow was lower within the soil. Does that make sense? Yeah. In terms of my first part, uh, or in terms well, of trying to link the two. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, I don't think my assumption is necessarily that the that the that the water quality would be impaired within those within those areas. Um, certainly, they've those so Comox has struggled in terms of trying to have an integrated watershed plan, thinking that forestry could have an effect. But they also have if you look at historical data for them, they have relatively high quality water. So I don't know if my assumption would be that forestry is necessarily having an effect on it, noting also that the catchment is larger. I don't know if that would necessarily be my assumption, I guess is my, my knee-jerk response to it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Oh yes. So, right. So, no. Okay. So previous, previous. Oh, so there's there's my work. But then previous studies have have been done, predominantly on sediment transport and how um, not only clear cutting but also the construction of roads and traffic on gravel roads affects sediment transport. And so a lot of um, when I say deleterious in the literature, a lot of correlations have been made between increased harvest and deleterious water um, con or water um, quality on the basis of increased sediment transport that's deriving from that those kind of effects. But I'm not, yeah, I, I'm not. I don't know if I would see. I'm not sure if I'll see that. I guess is my question. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry about that. Oh. Sure. <laughs>